Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. The show, as most of you know, brings you the libertarian perspective on what's going on in the world, and I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host Richard Eveline, who teaches economics at the Citadel and is a, another longtime libertarian. Richard, good to see you again. Great to see you, and thank you to our viewers and listeners. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. If you're new to FFF, come and visit us at FFF.org. That's our website. Thousands of articles dating back some 30 years, including many, many articles by Richard and by me. And, of course, other writers, James Bovard, Lawrence Vance, Wendy McElroy, uh, and many, many more. Okay, Richard, you wrote a very interesting article of an autobiographical nature on the website of the American Institute for Economic Research. Uh, that we reprinted this week at, on, on FFF's website, or maybe last week, and it, it really details your discovery of libertarianism and your evolution as a libertarian, how you got to the point where you are today. So I thought, you know, why don't we take out a libertarian angle segment and talk about your history and how you discovered libertarianism, some of the highlights of, of your libertarian discovery and exploration. So why don't you start start us from the beginning? Well, as I say in the article, uh, Jacob, it all began with the day I was born. The doctor picked me up by my little feet and slapped my tiny butt and I cried and shouted out. And at that instance, I realized the core concept of Austrian economics, man acts. And then I reflected for an instant and I realized that this physician had slapped my tiny butt without my permission. Was this not a violation of the non-aggression axiom? And from that point forward, Jacob, the rest is history. Now, as, as I suggest in the article, the, 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 the reader and perhaps the viewer will figure that that's maybe not the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you'd be right. Uh, I actually uh, was born in New York City, my family, when I was about 12 years old, moved to Southern California, and I grew up uh, uh, in my teens in Hollywood, California. Hooray for Hollywood, that rootin' tootin' shootin' Hollywood. Anyway, so I grew up in Hollywood, went to Hollywood High. Uh, if those who remember an old TV sitcom named Three's Company, starring John Ritter, uh, Tex Ritter's son, uh, John Ritter was my student body president. He was a senior when I was a sophomore. Uh, but anyway, that's where I grew up. Uh, and I, my family was, uh, let me put it this way, not financially very well to do. So as a consequence, uh, even though I was in high school, I had a part-time job uh, every afternoon in the Hollywood Public Library. Part of my duties, Jacob, was to care for the magazine collections, uh, which were up on a balcony. So, you know, a new issue comes in, someone has asked to see an issue, you have to put them all in the right places. So I usually finish my work in a couple of hours and then I would goof off <laughs> the rest of the time reading magazine articles up on the balcony. And from the time I was like in an early teen, I don't, you know, how, how, why do people get interested in things? I just found current affairs and policy and history interesting. So I started reading all these news magazines, the old ones as well as the new ones. And I was very conflated here, because uh, conflicted, because on the one hand, uh, I would read magazines like The Nation, The New Republic, considered you know, left of center or progressive, and, and they touch the parts of the strings. Why do you care about your fellow man? What about social justice? Can, can, you, can you sleep at night knowing that there's a world of insensitivity and exploitation? Oh, there ought to be a law. And I was deeply touched by this. But then I was reading the other literature, Jacob, you know, the quote conservative literature, Human Events, National Review, a few others. And they would always say, there's a bottom line. It doesn't work. It costs a lot of money. And those commies seem to kill a lot of people. I'm so confused. My heart, my head, oh. And so, uh, when I was about 16, 17 years old, 
I ran into two guys at a okay, restaurant. Now, wait, now, now, wait a minute. Before you go to that, that part of the story, because that, yeah. that part of the story is really critical, let me ask you a couple questions. Okay, so you're at Hollywood High, and you're, you're over there with John Ritter as your student body president. And, I mean, this is obviously, there's a lot of actors and agents around there. So I'm curious as to whether any agents ever discovered you for any movie roles during that period of time. I think they wanted to hire me as a street sweeper or, or, or you know, someone run over by a car, maybe. I don't know. Well, no, the reason, no not... the reason I raise that is because based on your reading habits of going to the library and stuff, I think you would have been a perfect for a movie like Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> Those in, 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 in video land, do you realize, realize I have to put up with this every week? <laughs> this is for... This is like for, what, it's almost 40 years now I've known this guy. I have a soul of calm tolerance. You have no idea. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get, to, we'll get to how we met later on. But, okay, tell the story about how the, the two guys, okay. so, uh, we started talking to these two so, guys. So, so I went to, you know, I'm about 16, 17 years old. And uh, as uh, Jacob was suggesting... I was a bit nerdy. You know that you're going to be a lonely guy in high school on a Friday and Saturday night when you're 16 years old and the girls already call you the professor. I was <laughs> such a lonely guy. But anyway, I lived under my, my burden. Anyway, so um, I had gone to a used bookstore along Hollywood Boulevard, bought a book that I even remember the title of. It was called Totalitarianism edited by a well-known political scientist of that time named Carl Friedrich. And I went into this restaurant at the corner of Hollywood and Vine named Hody's. It's no longer there. And uh, there, was, there was a counter, you know, with the stools, and I sit down between these two guys. And I later found out that this was their routine. They would sit there and leave a, seat, a stool seat in between, uh, like the spiders attracting the fly. But anyway, so, you know, one of them asked me, I, what's this book you're looking at? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And they, and the other one chimes in, and finally one of them says, "Have you ever heard of Ayn Rand?" And I, I said, I, you know, I, I'm, "I'm familiar with the Rand Corporation. What's an Ayn?" And uh, they said, "No, no, you're, 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 she's a famous, well-known author. She writes about these political and social and moral issues." We go on maybe for another half hour or so, and one of them whips out of his pocket a paperback copy of *Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal*. We want you to read this and come back in three days. So I go home and I read this as a true story. I go home and this is great, you know, capitalism is moral, it, it, it not only delivers the goods, but it's just, and, and, and the debunking all these myths about the industrial revolution to some of these other articles. So I go back in three days and we talk about this, I'm excited, and I hand back the book and now they hand me a paperback copy of The Virtue of Selfishness, her other group of non-fiction non, uh, non essays come back in three days. I read this. This, this Now I'm hooked. Oh, the, the individual has a right to his own life. The collective and the tribe does not have a claim on his mind or the fruits of his labor. This is great. So now I go back and talk, talking, hand back the book, and then one of them whips out a paperback copy of Atlas Shrugged. Eh, it's over a thousand pages. My heart sinks. I know they're going to say three days. Oh, no. We want you to read this and come back in 10 days. I wiped the sweat from my brow. But I went home and I, I read this. And uh, I read the famous John Galt speech three times. And, and that was before I took the Evelyn Wood speed reading course. Anyway, so uh, I come back and we talk. And they say, well, you know, you really should get into her novels more. You know, there's The Fountainhead, there's these others. And then says, you know, if you really are interested in this, they offer taped lectures about her philosophy. Taped lectures? Yeah, right here in Hollywood. Now, those were the days when there was still a Nathaniel Brandon Institute, which was sort of the center of the espousal and uh, evangelizing for her ideas. And uh, th they would have these people associated with them in, around the country. And every week or every other week, there'd be a, a le tape lecture. You'd go to a building, you'd listen to a tape lecture that were being given at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute in New York. And there were some really strange people there. I mean, everybody tried to look like an Ayn Rand fiction novel character. Uh, you, 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 you'd have people trying to look like Howard Rourke 
jutting out a granite jaw where, without jaws. You, you'd have women wearing you know, capes and felt brim hats over one eye, trying to look like you know, uh, Dominique or Dagny, or Dagny Taggart or something. Uh, but but anyway, uh, it was very interesting, and they would give her have a break, you know, coffee, go to the restroom, and there were these books, you know, Ayn Rand approved books that you could buy, and that's Jacob. That's how I found out that my first stuff about really free market economics and what became Austrian economics, because you know, in terms of classical liberal stuff, there was Frederick Bastiat, Herbert Spencer, William Graham Sumner, and then of course, uh, 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 you know, Ludwig von Mises, Karl Menger. Um, I, either then or after that, I found a copy of, of the Freeman published by the Foundation for Economic Education. So I was kind of hooked on all this reading all on my own. Uh, and then uh, about a year later, 1968, I guess, early 68, maybe it was during the Christmas break in early January, uh, I went to New York to visit relatives, actually my grandmother. and. Uh, so I wasn't going to miss this opportunity, so I went to Nathaniel Brandon Institute at least twice, maybe three times, when they had like these social events. I went to a lecture. <coughs> it's a social event. Who shows up with her husband? Ayn Rand with Frank O'Connor. And uh, she, she's dressed in a red denim railway men's outfit with like a little choo-choo-choo conductor's cap. And, and Frank O'Connor is dressed up, uh, for those old enough to remember, a Nehru suit, like the, the Prime Minister of India, a Russo, with, with, with love beads. I, I never found out the reason for this. I, in fact, I was afraid to ask. But anyway, uh, um, you know, a few of us came up to her, and she very kindly, very nicely, for about a half hour, 45, 40 minutes or so, <coughs> sat, around, sat around with us, uh, stood around, actually, and took our questions. And as I say in the article, I mean, those pictures, those images that people have told about, she would just look right you right in the eye, her eyes never would vary, listening to your question, making her comment. She was very reasonable, very logical, uh, firm. She obviously did not suffer fools gladly, uh, but 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 she, she, she was a, a fascinating person to meet. And I actually got an autographed copy of, of Atlas Shrugged. Um, so, so, so that sort of solidified my views on this. I went back to California. Uh, after that, the Nathaniel Brandon Institute collapsed, uh, so it was basically just her, her objectivist uh, newsletter and then her magazine, The Objectivist, uh, and then she continued to put these volumes of essays out. Uh, but to, to, to just continue the story, uh, I ended up in the Navy for a while, the Naval Reserves, uh, seeing active duty in uh, San Diego, California. This was during the Vietnam War years. and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, when I got out of the Navy, uh, I decided to get serious and go back to school. So I ended up uh, going to California State University in Sacramento. Family had moved up there, uh, trying to save money living at home. And uh, my, my horror was that, you know, all, all my professors were Keynesians or Stalinist Marxists, not just Marxists, Stalinist Marxists, and, and, and Vavlinian institutionalists who denied economic laws of economics. But I somehow persevered. It was an interesting experience uh, interacting with those. Uh, they got very upset with me, Jacob, because there, there was this lo like coffee lounge that econ majors and faculty would share, and there was a bulletin board. So one day I put up this picture of the Marx brothers, Harpo, Chico, Zeppo, and Groucho, from, from a still from one of their old movies, where their heads are popping out of those old like large beer barrels. And I wrote underneath four Marxist leading theoreticians. <laughs> Dare I say the Marxist and Stalinists were not amused by this. And, uh, and, and then when, when, when Hayek won the Nobel Prize in Economics, which was in the autumn of 1974, uh, on that same bulletin board, I put up this big sign, Austrian economist Friedrich A. Hayek wins Nobel Prize in Economics. And then in little letters in parentheses, shared with socialist Gunnar Myrdal. And of course, that was the opposite of how those professors would have uh, liked to do it. But anyway, uh, and I, I, I irritated them a lot. One day, I, early in the morning, I came in uh, when, when this lounge was just opening, and it was a Monday, and someone had stolen the, the, the coffee packages, you know, you put the packages in the coffee maker, you know, to brew a pot, and someone had broken and stolen. And one of the Marxist professors came in and said, what, what, no coffee? So, someone stole the coffee? And I just looked at him and went, 
see what happens when you don't respect private property? <laughs> oh, he was not amused. Anyway, so I, I don't even know how I graduated. I drove these people nuts up. But anyway, uh, I, I, I would spend all my time in the library. I, it irritated me that I'm in these classes and these students are just eating all this stuff up. Yes, yes, Karl Marx, yes, he saved the world. Oh, Keynes, Keynes, I worship at the feet of Keynes. Yes, he, he saved capitalism. I, I, I couldn't stand that stuff. So I, I would go into the library and I was reading articles, old economics journals, books that I find. And so, so as I say in the article, instead of going to the football game or out on dates, the girl still considered me the professor. It was so sad. But anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just absorbing all this literature and I, whatever I would learn. I would try to argue with the professors, not so much to make points with the professor, uh, but, but just so the students would know there were there was these other views other than this Marxist and Keynesian stuff. So in spite of that, I somehow graduated. And uh, then I went off to New York uh, and started uh, studying uh, with the Austrian economics program at NYU. And the reason this came up was that in 1974, the Institute for Humane Studies, IHS, which was then headquartered in uh, uh, Menlo Park, California at the time, they're now in Virginia, uh, uh, held the first ever Austrian economics conference in like, uh, 100 years. And I had been introduced to the, the founder of IHS, uh, Floyd Baldy Harper, who in 1973, I believe, passed away. But uh, I, I get to know him and his associates, and the IHS was putting on this conference, and I, I sufficiently, even though I was an undergraduate, got invited. And so I went off to, to South Royalton, Vermont, where this was being held in the middle of New England nowhere. And that was my first introduction ever meeting real live Austrians, uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, Israel Kirzner, uh, Ludwig Lachmann, and then a whole bunch of young uh, students who, uh, in, the current generation of Austrian economists, you know, of my generation, have become well-known figures. They, they, they were like, the, the, they became the next generation of Austrian economists. So for a week in South Wales and Vermont, we listened to lectures on Austrian economics by Kirzner, Rothbard, and Lachman. Uh, and, and Murray would, would just regale us all night, you know. Um, Murray was a night owl, so he would, he, we, we, we'd be in the hotel, you know, you know lounge room. A whole large number of us. He'd be real down with stories and jokes. He would sing communist songs. He would sing fascist songs. He even sang a few libertarian songs. Not that we libertarians have that much music. Uh, and uh, you know, and, and then finally it would be like about three o'clock in the morning, and Joey Rothbard, Murray's wife, would come down and say, "Murray, you you're lecturing first at nine o'clock." Oh no no, Joey, I, I have to finish this story. Murray, it's bedtime. You need your sleep. But but Joey, just one more thing. She would just grab his head and take him and say, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> yes. And what, what year was this conference in? 1974, June 1974. Okay, and how old were you? I was 24. Okay, so that was Your really lad. a landmark. That turned out to be a landmark conference in the history of the Austrian economics movement, right? It basically was the catalyst for the revival of an Austrian school of economics in the post-World War period. And I say that with almost no exaggeration. Um, because of the rise of Keynesianism in the 1930s and 40s, and, 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 the, and, and the emerging you know, attitude that either a, a, a Soviet-type socialism or a democratic socialism was the wave of the future planning versus market failures that had given us the Great Depression. Uh, Austrian ideas against government intervention, against socialism, just were, were lost in this Keynesian and socialist uh, tidal wave. Uh, so, so that by the 1950s, there was no Austrian school. There was Ludwig von Mises, who had come from Europe and was a visiting professor teaching uh, a couple of classes at New York University. Um, there was Ludwig Lachmann, who was uh, uh, teaching at the University of Weidwaterstrand. He had earned a master's degree with Hayek at the London School of Economics in the 1930s. There was Hayek himself, who uh, up until 1960 was at the University of Chicago, but no longer doing economics. He was doing political philosophy and social philosophy, the Constitution of Liberty, what became law, legislation, and liberty, his two last major political uh, treatises. Uh, but Austrian economics had died. Its revival started with uh, 
Ludwig, uh, Ludwig von Mises having two graduate students whom he inspired. Murray Rothbard, who actually was getting his PhD at Columbia University, and Israel Kersner, who studied with Mises at NYU and actually did his doctoral dissertation uh, under Mises and ended up himself becoming a professor at NYU. And Murray and Israel Kersner had been publishing some books in the early mid 60s. But there was this, you know, just a handful of people who found this literature, found this history. But I just brought virtually everyone with an interest in this together. These three speakers, Rothbard, Kersner, and Lachman, and about 40 or 45 people to this conference in South Royalton, Vermont. And that was the catalyst for the revival of the Austrian school. The proceedings, their lectures were published about a year and a half later called Modern Foundations of Austrian Economics. Uh, Israel Kersner got the funding to begin a graduate Austrian economics program at NYU. And that, 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 was, that was the beginning of, of, of a new Austrian school, because up to then, except for a person here and there who had an individual interest in it, the, the school had died. So that conference was, you were absolutely right, Jacob, profoundly important in the history of ideas. All right. Now, you, you also got to meet um, Friedrich Hayek and interact with him with, with because of a, an internship or something, the fellowship that you had with the, with Inst the Institute for Inst Humane Studies, right? Yes. Uh, as a result of these conferences, there were two that I attended. This first one in South Royalton from on June of 1974, and then there was a follow-up one the next year. Uh, at the University of Hartford in Connecticut that was sponsored and coordinated by a professor there, um, an excellent Austrian economist uh, and, and, and a real expert on antitrust law, Dom Armentano, he's now retired in Florida. But he taught there and he hosted an IHS sponsored that one. And as a result of that time, both summers, uh, that 1975 and then 1977, uh, I had summer fellowships at the Institute for Humane Studies, again, when they were headquartered out in Menlo Park, California. And so uh, many of these young Austrians were there, again, who have since become well known in the Austrian movement. But both of those summers, Friedrich Hayek was there as a senior resident scholar. And by the luck of the draw, my office was either next to his or just toured two doors down. And uh, as I explained in the article, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like 70, uh, I'm 25 years old, 26 years old. And and he's he's like, he's in his uh, like mid or mid, late 70s. So for someone in their 20s, 70s seems like ancient. And uh, so I said, oh my God, he's in his 70s. He, he might not come into the office tomorrow. He could croak in his sleep, oh no. So uh, being brash and impetuous, uh, I decided to take it upon myself to be a pest and uh, a Whenever he was in the office, I would always try to, you know, get his attention for an hour or two, which was at least three or four times a week, uh, to go in and just ask him questions about the about his time with Mises in Vienna, uh, his his battles with Keynes in Great Britain, his 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 conflicts with the socialists uh, in the 1930s and 40s and so on. And I have to say, as I say in the article, he was an unbelievably gracious and polite and courteous and patient man. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I asked him some questions that he'd heard a million times over his career. His attitude was he was treating my questions as if he was hearing them for the first time. Uh, he was self-deprecating. He would make fun of himself, as he referred to some my great failures against Keynes and the socialists. I mean, he, if you could have an image of, of the ideal Nobel laureate, wise, patient, kind, sharing his wisdom, uh, in my mind, that was Friedrich Hayek. It was, it was, a, it was one of the high points of my intellectual life, uh, being in his proximity for the, that length of time for two summers. Well, I'll just uh, interrupt what you talked about for a second. When I, I recall when I was working at the Foundation for Economic Education and you came in to New York and you said, would you like to meet Margaret Mises? And uh, I said, absolutely. And you took me over to, to Margaret's apartment there in New York and that was that was a tremendous high for me to be able to meet Ludwig von Mises's uh, wife or widow, and right. uh, so I appreciate you doing that. But you never got to meet Mises, right? No, he passed away when I was uh, an undergraduate in California. Uh, well, how that came about is that in 1977, Margaret von Mises had published a book called My Years with Ludwig von Mises, her life with Mises, 
And uh, Murray Rothbard had asked me to do a review of it for a sort of a newsletter he was publishing, long gone obviously, called Libertarian Forum. And he gave me a nice amount of space so I could talk about it in some more detail. And he had shared it with Margaret Mises and she liked it. And she asked Murray if she, uh, she, he would introduce me to her. So one Sunday for a brunch, uh, I went over there uh, to Murray and Joey Rothbard's apartment, um, not far from where Margaret Mises was living, which was the same apartment she had been in, apartment she had been with Mises, and we had we had a brunch, a, a delightful quiche that uh, Joey prepared, and so you know we just seemed to kick it off. So, but before I left, uh, she gave me her address and phone number, and asked me to call her about a week later. And before I know it, I I, I was now visiting her on average once or twice a month for years while I was still living in New York um, for tea. She would prepare tea and these little uh, you know, finger sandwiches and biscuits and stuff. And I'm going to share this story about your visit, Jacob. <laughs> you open, yeah, as, as, as you would have said in a court of law, my opponent has opened the door <laughs> to this line of questioning. Anyway, so, uh, so I, I invited Jacob to go with me. I arranged it with him. So we go there and did a nice little you know, tea and sandwiches, whatever she was serving. And, and, and Jacob has his copy of her book and says... No, 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 no. She, she gave me a copy of Omnipotent. Oh, she Gilbert. gave you a copy. That's right. And, now, and you wanted it autographed. Right. And she said, no, no. You have to earn it. <laughs> and so I'm sitting on the couch talking to Margaret, and Jacob is in her little kitchen washing the dishes and cleaning up and drying everything. <laughs> And then after he... But get scared to death work, because this is like her fine china. She says, yes, yeah, I'm going to keep talking to Richard. And so would you go wash the dishes? So I, I'm watching I'm watching Margaret Mar Mises' dishes, but nervous as heck that I'm going to break them. <laughs> so so now so now he, he comes out and, and you know, he wants it. And so, so, you know, so she autographs the book you know, to, to Jacob Hornberger for a job well done. You see, she had gone in and inspected the kitchen to see if everything was okay. For a job well done, Margaret von Mises. So that's the inscription in his copy of the book. And if any of you ever see it, that's what it means. He, 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 he was the, the dishwasher. Yeah, but, no, but, but, but you didn't tell the final end of the story. She, As I'm leaving, she, she whispers to me, no one will ever know what the job was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so you, you, end, you ended up having a big uh, uh, relationship and, and influence. I mean, the, the the institution that really influenced you, was, like me, was the Foundation for Economic Education. Yes. So how did that come about? Well, um, um, early, also in in the nineteen sixties, when I after I found this stuff and I found out about the Freeman and stuff, I started corresponding with one of their senior staff members, Bettina Bien Graves, a delightful woman. Um, a master of everything Mises. She was one of their, you know, copy editors, experts on a variety of things. She finally, she kindly started sending me literature that I had not been able to get a hold of. She, she was telling me about additional people and things I should read. And so I, I had written to her. Remember, this is before email or uh, cell phones. You know, you, you wrote in snail mail. I had written her that I was going to this first Austrian economics conference in South Royalton, Vermont, June 1974. And she said, well, by the way, the week after your conference in Vermont, we're actually having one of our week-long fee summer seminars right here on the grounds in Irvington on Hudson. Would you like to come? I'll arrange a scholarship for you. So from the Austrian conference, I went directly to fee. And it was great because uh, what, among the lectures, Bettina Graves lectured, Paul Poirot, uh, who was the editor of the Freeman, uh, Ed Opitz, who was the resident libertarian theologian. Uh, um, uh, uh, they had guest speakers, Hans Senholz, who is head of the economics department at Grove City College and had done his dissertation under Mises, uh, and uh, Henry Hazlitt. Hazlitt had been at the Austrian conference in Vermont, so I had met him, but he didn't speak. But he did give a lecture at Fee, and he was great. He spoke about uh, Bastiat and the invisible and, and secondary consequences. You know, what is seen and what is not seen. 
But as I say, uh, I've written in in other places, the lecture that I remember crystal clear, uh, and the only one I really remember crystal clear, is the one that Leonard Reed delivered. His famous lecture about uh, the, the, the being a light for liberty, where he had the lights turned off in the classroom, off the library, um, and he had an electric candle, and he began el turning the electric candle on slightly, you know, the dimmer switch. And from this little bit of light, he said, notice that this wee bit of light attracts all of our attention. Uh, and then he started turning it more and more on. And he says, notice that as I turn the, the, the illumination up, we see more of the room. I, we see people in the front row. You see more of me here in the, at, at the chalkboard. And then he turned it full illumination, a brightness. And he said, notice that the almost the entire room is lit up. There's just a few dark corners of, of, of that's still in the shadows. And he said, that's what each one of us can be. Each one of us can be lights of liberty to the extent that we learn the ideas of freedom and can express them and articulate them and in polite and courteous ways share them with others. Our light can attract others to become lights of liberty until finally there are enough of us that all of the collectivism in the society will have been pushed into the darkness of a few corners and freedom will prevail. That, that, that's that's a profound imagery, at least it always has seemed that way to me. I, I've often used that uh, and given him totally credit. I've explained the context uh, when I've concluded some of my own public talks in a libertarian student circle in particular, because I mean, it's profoundly, profoundly insightful that as he would always say, you want to change the world. Well, if you want to change the world, who do you begin with? Who do you have the most immediate and direct influence over? The answer is yourself. And that means the process of self-improvement and self-education. And then one person at a time, one mind at a time, the world will change. And hopefully eventually for the better. So I, that was a great, great opportunity that I had. Yeah, I had the same experience when I discovered Fee and went to their seminars. So you ended up going to New York University to study for a PhD. And that was under Israel Kirzner? I was part of the graduate program. I ended up earning a master's at Rutgers. Uh, but I took courses from Israel Kirzner, Ludwig Lachmann, uh, a number of other Austrians who were there, not part of the Kirzner's Austrian program, but were older Austrians who had, been, who, had been, who had been part of Mises' circle uh, in the old Vienna days. Uh, Fritz Machlu, who had done his own dissertation under Hayek at the University of Vienna, uh, Oscar Morgenstern, who uh, had uh, who who had uh, uh, been a student of Mises's at the university for a period of time, uh, so I had a chance to study and get to know all of these people rather intimately, in terms of going to their offices, questioning them. In fact, Fritz Machlup, who was an actually charming man and was full of humorous stories about the old Vienna days, uh, Mises and the other Austrians and the cultural milieu. Uh, I had uh, lunch with him on January 27th, uh, 1981, 80, 1980, and uh, he was saying he, I was going, I was, I was going off to teach in Ireland uh, soon after that. And he said, said that uh, uh, when you get back, and I have had a heart operation that I'm going in for soon, we have to get back together again. Uh, well, let me share some more stories with you. But alas, three days later, on January 30th of that year, 1980. He passed away from a heart attack before he could have the operation. Mm -hmm. And so he stuck in my mind because you see January 30th is my birthday. So whenever my, a new birthday rolls around, um, I always remember uh, how charming and gracious uh, Fritz Machlup was, uh, and both as an excellent professor, but as someone willing to share his experience and knowledge with a young person who was interested in them. All right, so was it at that point that you went to Dallas? No, I had, uh, I had, I went off and I taught in Ireland for two years. Uh, the academic years, uh, that would have been 81 to 82, I guess, and 83. Uh, I was invited to be a visiting professor by uh, a head of economics department at the University of College of Cork in Southern Ireland. Uh, one of their staff members was going on leave of absence. He invited me to replace him for two years. I had a delightful time. It gave me a chance to go over to Europe uh, to, to England many times, um, interact with a wide variety of fascinating people there. Uh, and then I came back uh, and I had a one-year fellowship with Kersner's NYU 
Austrian program. And it was after that in 1984, uh, the autumn of 1984, that I moved to Dallas, the University of Dallas in Irving, Texas. And it was there that you and I met. Uh, uh, both of us have told this story, so I'll start and if you want well, to add let, But let me first set the stage for it, because I was, I was taking a tutorial under, I was practicing law in Dallas at the time, and I was uh, taking a tutorial with the head of the Department of Economics at the University of Dallas in Irving, uh, named Sam Bostaff, and the tutorial had started out with Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and went through the Classical Economists, and, and ultimately Carl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School's Principles of Economics, and at that point, he says to me, look, you know, I really like taking your money, your fee that you're paying me, and I enjoy the, our, our weekly sessions, but there's somebody coming into the department that's your age that is the widest read, most knowledgeable person about Austrian economics of your age group. And so, if assuming he's willing to do it, we were about to, to, to move into human action, um, Mises' magnum opus, he says, I, I think in good conscience, I need to turn you over to Richard. And that's how you and I met then. Yes. So uh, Jacob uh, called me or came over to the university and I met him. I, that I don't remember. Anyway, so he, he, he told me he wanted to be tutored in human action. And I was reluctant to do this. The reason being well, is that, that I was make, new. Let's clarify. I didn't want to be tutored in human action. I wanted to be tutored in the book, Human Action. I repeat, <laughs> I have endured this for decades. <laughs> anyway, so he, he wanted to be tutored in the book. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I was reluctant to do this. Uh, I was new. I was going to be teaching a couple of classes I hadn't taught before, you know, preparation of the lectures and whatnot. But he told me what he'd be willing to pay me. So after thinking two seconds, I said yes. Uh, so as I like to tell the story, uh, he would come once a week and I will prepare you know, notes outlining each of the chapters in human action. And we would start out doing that, but invariably less than halfway through, our conversations would drift into other directions, which invariably he instigated. Uh, talking about general libertarian principles of freedom and you know, what the role of government is, uh, you know, as, he would, as he was saying, he was checking me for leaks, you know, where was I inconsistent or unprincipled? <laughs> if you only knew the weaknesses I found in him. Oh, it's embarrassing. Anyway, so, so we would do this. And then uh, it was Friday afternoon. He often would then you know, invite me to, to lunch and he'd be picking up the tab. So what, about a year, year and a half later than that, maybe, maybe two years, he announces that he's going off to New York to become the program director at the Foundation for Economic Education. I, 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 was, I was depressed. I'd had good pay for almost no work, including a free lunch. You have no idea how despondent I was. This was leaving me. So he, he, he went off, you traitor. You. And, uh, but uh, I did see Jacob because he periodically would invite me, since he was the program director, to give lectures at the summer student seminars. And then uh, in 1989, uh, oh, now, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second, because th th we had a good time of those years in, in Dallas that you'll recall that I organized the Mont Dallas Society, which was That's modeled true. after the Mont, named after the Mont Pelerin Society. And we, we, we had a lot of Austrians there where we would meet once a month and each of the members of the Mont Dallas Society would make a presentation on any subject that he wanted and, and he got to pick the restaurants. So we rotated among restaurants in Dallas. And we it was a great time. We had people like Gary Short, who had uh, been also a fellow at the Institute for Humane Studies. He was a lawyer there. And his wife, Jeannie, was a member of the Federal Reserve. Same thing with her. She had been a fellow at IHS. We had a Hutt, W.H. Hutt, that was a free market scholar at the University of Dallas. We had yes. Sam Bostaff. Uh, yes. Peter Lewin, young economics professor, uh, yes. and I think, think maybe a couple more. And then we had the speakers program where um, we were organizing speakers coming in once a month to, to give perspectives on liberty. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, that oh, we yeah, had. Hans Senholz was one of those speakers. Hans Senholz, yeah, from FEE yes. and from Grove City College. Okay, so at some point I moved in, I guess it was 87, to FEE to become program director. And then after that you end up moving to... Hillsdale College. 
Yes, uh, I I had been offered a position uh, in the spring of 1988 uh, for uh, the Ludwig von Mises Chair in Economics at Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. Uh, and uh, I accepted it. Uh, and I was at Hillsdale for 13, well, almost 15 years, actually, from school year 1988 until uh, the end of school year 2003. Um, I had a lot of fun there. Uh, the president of Hillsdale College at that time, George Roach, was, was a, a great fan of Mises and Austrian economics. Uh, before becoming the president of Hillsdale College, uh, he had been the program director at FEE under Leonard Reed. Uh, and he was offered the, the presidency of Hillsdale, which he accepted. Uh, and at that time, when he did accept it, he was the youngest college president in the United States. Uh, and uh, he immediately started arranging uh, to, uh, particularly right after Mises died in 1973, um, to acquire Mises's library from Margaret von Mises. To be honest, she needed money. He had not left her very much. Um, and uh, he, be, he raised the money for a Ludwig von Mises lecture series, annual lecture series, as well as to fund a chair in, in, in Austrian economics named after him. So uh, in, in 1988, I was, I was invited and accepted that chair. Uh, and I held it for 15 years. Uh, the students were great. I enjoyed my classes. It was also during that time uh, that I discovered the lost papers of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, we've shared this with our viewers and listeners before, so I'll just give a very abbreviated version, Jacob, uh, particularly, you know, time constraints. Uh, uh, in March of 1938, uh, Hitler had ordered the invasion of neighboring Austria, his own native land, and incorporated it into Nazi Germany. Uh, the Gestapo came looking for Mises. Uh, he was an outspoken critic of all forms of collectivism, including Nazism. He also was Jewish. Uh, but he had been teaching in Geneva, Switzerland by that time for about four years. So he was safe in neutral Switzerland. But they broke into the apartment where he had lived in Vienna and from whom he was renting what had been his room in the apartment from the new tenants, where he stored his papers, his documents, his correspondence, uh, part of his library, family effects. And the Nazis basically took this and carted it all away. And again, to make a long story short, Mises believed that everything had been lost. Either the Nazis had destroyed it, which wouldn't have been unusual, or maybe had been in a warehouse that the Allies had bombed during the war, and that was it. But in fact, that plus millions of pages of other collections and archival uh, materials that the Nazis had plundered all over Europe and from countries they occupied ended up in Czechoslovakia, which they obviously had conquered and annexed. And uh, among these millions of pages of material that they had stolen from every occupied country were Mises's papers. And uh, Czechoslovakia was, quote, liberated by the Soviet army. Uh, it fell into the hands of the of the Soviet officials. Uh, the KGB examined these massive collections of personal papers and government archives uh, that the Nazis had seized and realized what they had found. They informed Stalin. Stalin ordered that everything be brought to Moscow uh, by train, including Mises' papers among this vast horde. Uh, and uh, a special archive was built for it, a KGB archive. And it sit there in a secret archive, along with these other huge collections of documents, uh, for almost half a century. But then in the 1990s, my wife and I were in uh, Vienna, Austria. I was doing research on Mises in the Austrian school. Uh, Hillsdale was helping to fund this. And uh, a friend of mine informed me that some people had been in Moscow looking for materials from before the war and had seemingly found uh, uh, an index to some collection of Ludwig von Mises' papers. What the hell is this? But th that was all they knew. So I went back to Hillsdale with, uh, and said this had been found, but what could be done with it? My wife, who is Russian, uh, tried to make contacts uh, in Moscow to see what the story was, uh, to no avail. But then in 1996, 
uh, she and I were uh, on a uh, uh, in, uh, in in New in uh, Washington D.C. and for another reason we went to the Holocaust Museum. But I said, you know, maybe they'll have something about Mises here. If nothing else, may, maybe in the Holocaust, you know, archives might be the curiosity of like a, a, a Gestapo file on Mises, right? Because he was Jewish, anti-Nazi. That wouldn't have been unusual. Uh, alas, there was none, or at least that anyone knew about. But I said, is there anything about maybe Mises in, Ma in Russia? And we were taken to an expert who handled Holocaust studies in the former Soviet Union. He said, you know, I, I just got a, an index to a, a previously closed government archive uh, with, with, with everything in their collection. We start going through it. One well, page here. Well, I mean, finally, we come to one of the pages uh, with all you know, the, the, the numbered uh, files. And this one says 623, 623. Ludwig Mises. That was this, Ludwig Mises. <clears throat> so we go back to Hillsdale. We form George Roach. He immediately gets in contact with some donors who loved Austrian economics. They put up a huge amount of money for my wife and I to go there. Because now we, from, this, from this index, we know the location, we have the address, we have a phone number, a fax number, and the name ahead of the director. So my wife had, had some of her friends intercede. And the long story short, in October of 1996, she and I traveled to Moscow, her, her friends there arranged this. And we basically spent about 10 days in this formerly secret archive and photocopied uh, about 10, almost 10,000 pages of material uh, of these papers of his that the Nazis had looted in 1938. Uh, when we came back, uh, the news obviously got out. Liberty Fund of Indianapolis, a nonprofit organization that handsomely publishes uh, enduring classics of liberty and uh, runs uh, uh, Socratic type seminars. Uh, said that we, they'd heard about this, we, and they would be interested in publishing a, a large selection of them. So uh, they offered to fund it, and uh, it asked if I would be the senior uh, editor to oversee the translations and uh, to edit them into a finished publishable volumes, which I did. And uh, they came out in three volumes over a series of years, uh, available from Liberty Fund on their website. Uh, either paperback hardcover or you actually just can download them as free PDFs and the three volumes are called The Selected Writings of Ludwig von Mises and uh, since we're talking about this if I can just go on for another minute or two on this thing they offer a side of Mises that we usually don't think about if you know anything about Aust the Austrian school and Mises you think of him as the grand theorist you know the, the, the critic of socialism uh, the developer of the Austrian theory of money in the business cycle and so on the fact is Mises made his living not as a professor, but as a policy analyst. Jobs were few and far between in the Vienna, between the two world wars. And uh, so what happened is that even before the First World War, after he graduated from the University of Vienna, he got a job as an economic analyst at the Vienna Chamber of Commerce, Crafts, and Industry. So he became a policy wonk with the nitty-gritty statistical details, a position that he held, except for the few years during World War I, where he fought in the Austrian army on the Russian front. Uh, for a quarter of a century, he made his living as a detailed, micro-focused uh, uh, economic analyst about uh, policies of, uh, of government regulation of industry, price controls, foreign exchange controls, uh, uh, government spending and deficits, uh, inflation and mismanagement of the banking system. Uh, and so he published a huge amount of articles as a policy analyst besides these famous works for which he's famous, well known for. But nobody knows it, knew about it. So a good part of these volumes, there are these more general essays about capitalism versus socialism and so on. But most, a good part of these essays are Mises, in a sense, applying Austrian economics to the topical policy issues of the Vienna of his day. And it presents a different side of him. How do you do Austrian economics as, as, as a policy analyst. And that's what a good number of these essays give the reader the opportunity to understand. And it, it fills a, a, a gap in our understanding of him and his contributions that otherwise would never be known about. Yeah, it was a monumental yeah. achievement and discovery that you and Anna had made. And it was even written up in the Wall Street Journal. Um, it, was, it was a huge uh, achievement. And then for y'all to bring it into print through with Liberty Fund is just fantastic. 
Uh, okay, well let, let's let's move let's move forward. We only have a little bit. Where I know we're going over time, but let's let's wrap it up before we spend an hour. But in 1990, while you're or 1989, 90, while you're at Hillsdale, I start FFF, and you become vice president of academic affairs. You give me good advice and insights on how to start a foundation and, and how to how to get it going. And you were writing a monthly article, and I remember our first year was so difficult. And we were taking our uncompromising positions, our principal positions that we still take to these to this day, and we were losing subscribers uh, every day. You know, like, oh well, I don't like your position on abolishing public schooling or your position in open borders and abolishing public schooling and so forth. And um, I remember you telling me, by the end of our first year, we will have gotten rid of all of our subscribers and supporters, and then I'll I'll do my best to work on you. <laughs> uh, but we Absolutely did it. true. But we did it. I mean, we, we survived. It was tough, but we're still here. And you and I are co-hosting the Libertarian Angle, and you're doing these articles for us. And so it's been a great friendship and a, and a great uh, working relationship. Um, now, in the middle of that, after about 13 years uh, at Hillsdale and writing for FFF and speaking at our conferences and so forth, you got uh, selected to be president of FEE which yes. was the organization that had such a powerful influence on both of us. And so tell, a little, tell us a little bit about that and uh, well, you know, the way you turned the organization around. And Well, I, I was president of FEE for five years, 2003 to 2008, half a decade. Uh, and t to be honest, uh, FEE had gone into a tailspin. The donor base, the vibrancy of its programs, uh, and eating away of its endowment. It virtually had no endowment. Uh, which had once been rather relatively large um, by the time I got there. They had a large budget deficit, uh, which uh, I was not fully told about when I took the job. Um, but this organization had been important to me, it was saying to you, in our formative years. I greatly admired the, 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 the approach and the sense and the philosophy that Leonard had given to the idea of espousing freedom. Uh, so I decided to try to turn it around because otherwise they were going to shut the doors, sell off the assets, and disperse them among other free market organizations. And they said so that directly, that I was sort of their last chance to save free. And uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to uh, hit the road, uh, meeting with remaining existing donors, interviews and meetings with former donors, uh, using various contracts to get an entree to new donors, uh, reviving the programs, starting to do regional seminars for mostly adults, with, which would have been a, a part of the, 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 the fee profile, certainly under Leonard Reed, uh, in improving and expanding the, the, the student summer seminars. Uh, what the upshot was is that uh, after five years, fee was turned around financially in terms of its profile. We had started doing student seminars in former Soviet bloc countries, including the Czech Republic, the Republic of, uh, of Georgia, uh, Armenia, Ukraine, uh, and uh, and the and I and after five years, the place was on a very solid financial basis as well. Uh, far larger budget from donations, and instead of the deficit that I found myself with at the uh, at the beginning of my tenure, uh, I left it with an actual uh, surplus leading into the next year. Besides having a larger donor budget as well, so that. That gave Fee a new life, which otherwise would have been just um, shuttered away as just a, a, a chapter in the history of freedom. And after that, uh, just to wrap up quickly to get to the present, um, I, uh, I taught at Northwood University for five years, Northwood, Michigan, uh, in Midland, Michigan. But uh, a little over five years ago, I was offered my present position, which is the BBNT Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And that's where I am now. That is where we are videotaping this, uh, which I do usually after my classes on Tuesday mornings. Uh, and uh, I, I still love what I do. I still enjoy my interactions. I have uh, uh, my writing, which, uh, which I do, as, as Jacob was saying, uh, both when I was vice president, uh, writing a monthly article in book review and now uh, continuing to write uh, an article for the monthly journal. I, I write for the American Institute for Economic Research weekly. My weekly articles for them are always very kindly and generously posted by 
by Jacob on the FFF website. I, I hope they are of some interest to, to the readers of, of the foundation. Uh, and all I see is that the, the, uh, there's a little bit more wear and tear uh, on, on this human vehicle. Uh, I would hope that uh, the fight for freedom will continue for a long time. And uh, as, as I believed when I began my journey, I still believe now that freedom will prevail. Uh, every form of tyranny and totalitarianism and collectivism imaginable has been tried, especially over the last century. And they've led to nothing but tyranny, terror, and mass murder and despair, both spiritually and materially. There is no alternative except liberty, classical liberalism, libertarianism, whatever you want to call it, or as Leonard Reed used to call it, the freedom philosophy. It is the only system that respects the individual with dignity and autonomy and bases human relationships on that most important principle, voluntary association and mutual agreement, rather than command, control, and coercion. Freedom has to be our future. Otherwise, it's the end of humanity. On that fine note, Richard, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I hope our viewers will pardon us for going over our standard 30-minute time. I thought uh, y'all would enjoy this uh, exploration, this history of exploration of liberty and discovery of liberty by Richard. And uh, I hope to see you guys again next week. And Richard, I greatly enjoyed the visit as always, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Until next week, thank you.